What is going on, guys? Ricky in the Flip Lab. Today, I'm here with Devin Burr. Some of you guys might know him as Mr. Burr. Yeah, See there. him on social media, making a bunch of videos on financial freedom, infinite banking. He does real estate. Kind of crazy. I know we've uh, we talked about this in our last podcast we did a little over a year ago, but me and Devin actually met on the first time I did a real estate wholesale deal. And it was his first time going on a buy appointment. It was kind of like law of attraction type thing. I feel like, you know, going back to the, to that day in 2019. And, you know, since then in 2020, we were golfing a lot and we were on the golf course. I'm like, dude, you should get on TikTok, start making videos. And then all of a sudden, man, here you are today, just crushing uh, the social media game, crushing life insurance policies Got that beautiful R8 outside that I'm jealous of. So <laughs> lots changed since uh, last time we did a podcast. Yeah, dude, it's been, it's been nuts. Um, just appreciate you, man. Appreciate like the, the relationship we have and the friendship we have. It's, it's kind of crazy when, yeah, what, not even four years ago, we're on that buy appointment. We don't know who each other are. Like we just know Templeton and like we're in this house. We're like, being awkward probably and temp's just doing his thing and yeah. <laughs> we're probably in there for like 20 minutes and he makes like 15 grand and i was doing a ride along while i still had a nine to five and i'm like i can do that it doesn't seem that hard he's just being likable being charismatic saying the right things at the right time yeah um so yeah i got into it and dude like what i've built the success i've built is really from social media that's what it's from and it wouldn't have happened. I'm telling you this right now. It wouldn't have happened without you. Like I tell people all the time, the story of how it happened where we're in that mastermind. It was uh, the eight-figure mastermind, yeah. right? That, that's what we coined it. <laughs> um, and I'm just like, how can I get more business? Like I was kind of stuck. I was halted at what I was doing. Yeah. And then you made the suggestion, like, dude, get on TikTok, start making some videos about real estate, infinite banking, then maybe you can get some more, um, some business that way. Dude, in my head, I'm thinking like my daughter's on TikTok. All I know on TikTok is her doing her little dances. And I'm like, Ricky, what are you talking about, bro? And then you showed me yours. Yeah. It was like, that was a time when like the platform was just starting to get away from dancing. And, um, you know, it was a really good time where I'm like, dude, I think it's a good opportunity Yeah, that you could really kind of blow up going from like a zero following to, you know, getting people to know who you are. Yeah. And I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, so it was like December 15th, 2020. Got on TikTok. I'm in my backyard trying to figure out how to like edit the videos. I tried a few where you're like pointing at stuff like people would do. <laughs> yeah. Back in the day on TikTok. And it's like, dude, dude I, I look at the videos, like the first couple, they're so cringeworthy. But then I made one where I'm just getting in my car and I'm like, let me show you how to get all the money back for any car you'll ever buy, drive and own. And I show my three cars so it kind of catches people's attention. And that's just me in the car, like explaining how I do it. Went to bed. Next day I get up 17,000 followers like that. And I was like, crazy. I was <laughs> like, I should probably keep doing that. Like making videos like that. And within a couple of weeks, I had 150,000 followers. Everyone's asking me like how to get these policies. Had no idea that I was going to sell them one day. I just was using them. Yeah, because I think we were in that mastermind and then someone recommended this <clears throat> book about infinite banking. No, no. Right? It was, Wasn't it something like that? No, it was uh, Steve Trang's podcast. Or Steve Trang's podcast. And then yeah. I think people in the mastermind, might, I think we might have talked about getting that book. But yeah. I think it was, we both heard about that book. And then I think you just read the book and was like, yo, this is a great hack for me to use in my own life. Yeah. And then you went into it with just, I think trying to make just videos about how you used it to try to just build a following to get real estate deals and stuff like that. But at the time it wasn't really this way of like, oh shit, these videos can help funnel clients into me writing insurance Dude, policies. And had no inclination, didn't even think that was where I was going with it. Yeah. It was just, yeah, this is something I've learned that has helped me because it did help my real estate business. I was making more money just by implementing this strategy. So I'm like, let me share how it works. So then I started sharing it. Everyone's asking me how to do it. So what do I do? Yeah, just go to this guy. I would send them to Chris Noggle, who's like, 
That's where I got my policy from. So I'm just sending like 10, 15 people a day to Chris. And he's probably just like loving me, like <laughs> right. just free business. <laughs> he hasn't got to do anything. So probably like a week goes by and I just got wise. And I'm like, why am I sending him all this business? Why don't I be the guy that sets it up? I'm already teaching people how it works. I know how it works. I don't have to sell it. I just have to teach people. So then got my license March of 21. And since then, as of today, I've set up over 1300 policies. Damn. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. All from social media, zero marketing, just me showing how I use the concept. Not even paid ads, like just Nothing. organic traffic, just yeah. from really just short content videos too, yeah. which is the crazy part. Like 30 to 60 second TikToks. Yeah. At and first Instagram it was TikTok. Rules. TikTok died off. TikTok, I can't get any traction on. TikTok's weird, man. It's like you you see it all across the board. Even mm -hmm. it's like I had the most followers on there out of all my platforms. Like I'm at like 105,000. I know you're at like a freaking million on there or close to it, but you see these creators on there right now with a million, 2 million followers and their videos are getting 10,000 views, 15,000 views. It's kind of, it's an interesting time over on that platform. Yeah. I mean, there's, I think there's reasons why, um, and this is just conspiracy. What I think might be happening, but I mean, it's owned by China. Like yeah, China, like that platform is owned by China. So what's going viral in China? Things that are about like mathematics, things that are about like building wealth, cash. Like if they don't, they don't have naked girls going viral in, in China. Yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. Like it just doesn't happen. They right. can make, they can put up a video of like, here's all the ways to get to 11 by adding two numbers. Nine plus two, six plus five, three plus eight, one plus 10 viral. Hmm. I put up something that's like perfect and just gives so much value about how to buy real estate, how to use other people's money to do it, how to use none of your own three, 400 views. So I, I think it is China. Yeah. But that again, that might just be I, me. Who conspiracy. Knows? Who knows? Yeah. Uh, a lot of the conspiracies these days are actually true. Yeah. From, from what I'm seeing over the last couple of years. But I mean, regardless though, it's like, I think it was, um, TikTok. It's still a, a really good platform. Like if you, if you're starting at zero and you, you have the chance of a video going super viral, but I think the followers from mm -hmm. that, you're not really like keeping them long term. Right. You know, compared to, I think, platforms like, like YouTube or, in, or Instagram where they're actually following you. Yeah. Like I know even me as a TikTok consumer, so much as I try to stay <laughs> off like the feed, just like watching fucking videos all day long, sometimes I get sucked into it. And I feel like I, I don't watch any more videos from really the people I follow. Yeah. It's just, just random videos served up to you. Yeah. Girls shaking their butts. Yeah. Prank, I mean, pranks in pranks, grocery stores. Yeah. Dumb shit. Like, I mean, sometimes my feed, like I do get some educational stuff, <coughs> but I mean, when you really break it down though, it's, it's so fucking random. Yeah. You know, but it's, it's, it's true though. Like having multiple platforms to put that out. That's what I've learned. At first it was just TikTok. Uh, my Instagram had like 2,500 followers and it was mostly from like my fitness days when I was like really jacked. So they weren't real estate followers. They weren't money followers. They weren't the followers I have now. Um, didn't have a YouTube started putting everything on all the platforms and one video blew up on, um, Instagram around probably June of last year. It's got like 4 million views. So now I'm sitting at, I think 220,000 followers on Instagram. And then it showed this morning, I just put up a story about this. It shows how many accounts you've reached in the last 30 days. Yeah. On Instagram, I've reached 1.6 million viewers or accounts in 30 days. And that's me getting off of the platform for two weeks. We can get into that if we want to, but I'd like delete all social media sometimes. So that was me off of the platform for two weeks. So basically in two weeks, I've reached 1.6 million people. That's the power of social media. That is crazy. I mean, we were on a snowboard trip up in Utah. We were having a good old time. We we're hitting the slopes, hitting, <clears throat> hitting fresh powder. And I mean, during all that time, your videos are getting views. I mean, you probably were booking appointments. You were probably still like 
having stuff working on the back end, even though, you know, you're just out there, not on social media, just having a good time snowboarding. Yeah. I tell people all the time, it's like, you can be successful with anything. Just find something you're really good at. Like prime example is I can't go teach people how to be a rocket scientist. I've never done it. Right. I can't go teach people how to buy yachts and sell them. I've never done it. I can probably figure it out, but I've never done it. So who's going to really listen to me? Teach people how to do something you're really freaking good at. Master one thing and then help other people do it. The more people you help do it, the more success you're going to have. And the less you really have to work because your evergreen content, the content that just keeps driving the machine is working for you. Prime example, yesterday, I'm looking at like, I'm, I geek out on numbers. One of the first things I do every morning is I look at bank accounts. Where's everything at? What do we have coming in? What's going out? I just want to like always know where my finances are at. Yeah. Because I've been broke. I've been bankrupt. So where I'm at now, I don't take for granted. I want to like grow it and keep it um, going up. So yesterday I'm looking and I'm, I go to my wife and I'm like, this month I'm on track to make X amount of dollars. I was like, I don't know if I deserve that. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't really work that hard to deserve that. And then she told me, she's like, no, you do deserve it. Think about how much content you've put out, how much time you've put into all that content over the last couple of years. That's working for you. You're not necessarily having to go work for it. It's working for you, but you put it out. It's still there. Anyone can see it. It can get served up at any time. So I urge people always just to find something they're really, really good at that helps them. Because if it helps them, it's going to help somebody else. So then all they got to do is just share it with as many people as you can. And what's the easiest way? Put it on social media where you have the ability to reach 1.6 million people in a month. I can't go talk to 1.6 million people in one month. Now, do you think like anyone could kind of replicate this or do you think there's like a fa- mm-hmm. fact, maybe, I don't know, you're charismatic, you got, you got nice teeth, like you got, you know, well, whatever it is, like, do you think it's something that people should be focused on? Because I see some people who are trying to make it in business and I feel like they almost spent too much time on social media and stopped making them anything. Yeah. And it was like yours, it almost seemed like it was like kind of just this like storm of kind of got on there without the exact intentions of, of doing what now you're monetizing. Right. So do, do, would you like give that advice to, to someone who's young, they want to figure out how to make money is put all that energy into social media or should they be focusing more on kind of like the gritty stuff of just, you know, hitting the phones and doing more like traditional type marketing? I think it's following what you're good at. Like I said, like, yeah. I figured out that I'm pretty damn good at just making videos and catching people's attention. Like I'm good at it. The facts show it, dude. Yeah. I mean, it's not just even like the infinite banking stuff. I mean, you had a Airbnb video that 10 million views that went crazy too. So like you've consistently at this point, you know how to get viral. You've gotten viral on multiple different platforms. You know, the videos work. Yeah. So I think it's more, more or less anything is just doing what you're really good at. If you're just stuff, freaking stud on the phones get on the phones be on the phones all the time and then if you've mastered it then just teach other people how to do it and you can monetize it by just selling a course right um if you're really really good on the phones and you can sell anything you can sell a course on how to do it because you know how to do it right yeah do you know how to come up with the course no but you can figure it out by asking questions from people that have already done it Right. So I think it just comes down to like focusing on your superpowers. Don't try to get good at everything. I am. We talked about this off camera. I'm horrible, horrible at technology stuff. Like looking at your setup right now, like gives me anxiety, all the (laughs) wires, like everything we were talking about. I want to start a podcast. Yeah. And for me to do that, like me personally to do it, I would probably lose sleep. Like which cord does this go into? Where does this go? How do I get from this camera to that camera? I don't know how to do it. So what would I do? Hire someone that knows how, or if I really want to do it myself and not pay for someone, just someone like you, how do I do it? Right. Yeah. Use your network of people and yeah. you know, 
someone someone can help you out with that and you know one day i might need a, a life insurance policy and i got a guy for that yeah you know so it's you know people it's good when you have people. Um, a network of people too that all kind of are doing similar stuff as you and kind of have similar goals and aspirations yeah because you're not going to be able to figure everything out yourself so you definitely need people to be able to kind of go to and ask and like even when i got into this i i asked pace's video guy bobby bobby yeah. yeah 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 shout out to bobby but i was like what cameras do i get like what do i need and he just gave me a checklist and then i went and did it and yeah you know figured but it out yeah figured it out but it you kind of need some people in your corner to kind of help you get there sometimes yeah I, I love bobby um did you know the mr burr video the music video yeah but bobby yeah shot that you, it. you and templeton did right yeah, yeah bobby shot that yeah so that was before he was pace's guy and um, when it dropped, it was on Instagram and Pace reached out to me. He's like, dude, this was awesome video. Who did it? And I was like, oh, it's this guy, Bobby. So <laughs> I think that I hooked Bobby and Pace up. You're welcome, Pace. <laughs> <laughs> Small world, man. It's funny when we like start seeing all, all of our circle and like who's connected who it's, you know, I connect you like with my new video guy and then like down the road, if, if videos come out, it's, you know, it's, it's, you good know, to, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to see that kind of all play out. Yeah. I mean, I, it comes from a space of abundance. I think like, I never think there's a shortage of anything, like especially money. Like when people think there's not enough money that goes around, the government printed trillions of dollars. There's enough money. You know what I mean? Um, there's enough R8s. If someone wants an R8, if they work their ass off, they can go find one, right? There's enough of everything. So like I used to have this mindset that I want to hoard on, hoard and like hold on to everything, information being one of it, because I thought there wasn't enough to go around. When I changed that mindset to like, there's enough for everybody. Let me just share everything that I know. Yeah. Dude. The second I started doing that, again, 2020, I was doing decent. 2020, I think I made 160. Um, You're doing some like real estate, wholesaling stuff, wholesaling flips. flips. I think we had just closed on two rentals. They were long term. So we're, we're making a ton, but that was like at the end of the year, mm -hmm. right? So most of it was from flips and wholesaling. And I made 160. My first year in real estate, like pretty good. Didn't pay as much taxes as I paid as a W-2 employee. Yep. So I actually made more money. My last year as a W-2 employee, I made 117. So I made more money and paid less taxes. Pretty freaking cool. That's that's a good first year of, you know, entrepreneurship. Yeah. But like I made 160 and what was I doing? I was just helping me. I was wholesaling, which would, I guess it helps a couple people, right? It might help the homeowner, helps the end buyer. So at most I'm helping three people right? In that transaction. Yeah. If I do a flip, I'm helping myself and I'm helping the end buyer, helping two people, right? Made 160. When I started teaching people infinite banking from 2020, making 160 to 2021, I made over 400. Over doubled yeah. wow. just because I changed one thing and that's just me just sharing and helping as many people as I could. And then Last year, I over doubled again. And this year, I'm on pace to triple. So it's like the more people you help, the more people you give your knowledge to and give your just a, be abundant, the more it comes back to you. It, every time, if you look at anyone who's super, super successful, they're helping a lot of people in some way or another. That's why they're successful. Abundance. Yeah. I, I love that. And I know there's probably some people on here, they've heard you now mention like in, this infinite banking. Yeah. Right. We we really went into it on our last podcast. If you also want to check that one out, but like- Yeah, we dove deep on that one. Yeah. But like, let's let's kind of dive into all of a sudden, <clears> like, <throat> like what is infinite banking and what can you do with it? So infinite banking is basically just being the bank in your own monetary life. So- Think about when you spend money, you do one of two things. You spend your money, so cash, right? Or you borrow money from a lender or from the bank. It's the only two things you do. Spend yours or borrow someone else's. If you borrow someone else's, what do you have to do? 
Got payback. With? With the cash. With interest. Interest, yeah. So yeah, you pay interest to borrow someone else's money. If you use your money, you give up your money's ability to earn interest, right? So if I've got 10 grand, let's say, and I buy a watch, I bought the watch. That's all I have. The 10 grand's gone. But if I take that 10 grand and I invest it into something that makes me 10%, I'm making 10%, right? So infinite banking is two things, never giving up your money's ability to earn you money for the rest of your life. But then also not having to pay ta- or not have to pay interest to someone else for borrowing their money. All you do is you put your money in a place that's guaranteed to grow. So it'll never stop earning you money. And then you just borrow against it. So if let's say I want to go buy that watch, if I borrow against my money, it's still earning because I'm not using it. I'm borrowing against it. So I borrow against it. It's still earning, let's say 6% tax free. Then I take the 10 grand buy the watch. Now I own the watch and my money's still compounding and growing. If I would have bought that watch, let's say on a credit card, what would I have to do? Pay, pay interest or paid off in full. Yeah. So all I do is I just act like I'm the credit card company or I'm the lender and I pay for the watch with interest back into my policy, which just builds it back up while it never stopped growing. So all you're doing is you're just being the bank in your own life. And it works with anything, watches, cars. I've bought three cars, home improvements. I did my wine cellar, um, real estate deals. Like, So, you know, you still you still need money, essentially. It's not going to like, you know, you're not going to be able to afford to buy that R8 outside right. if you're not making income. Right. But it's like you're, you're getting the most out of <clears throat> the money that you're making. We all know, like, leaving it in Wells Fargo isn't doing shit right now. Right. You need money, but everyone has money. They just, what do they do with it? They take it and they put it in the bank, right? Yeah. What does the bank do with the money? They, I mean, they're reinvesting it all now. I mean. Every, every penny, they lend it out. Like, like, you know, since COVID, the day COVID happened uh, or lockdowns happened, March 15th of 2020. Yeah. uh, The, the Federal Reserve uh, Banking is essentially the um, fractional reserve banking. You know how like they would have to keep at least like 10%. So if you deposit a hundred bucks into the bank account, right? They just gotta keep 10. They gotta keep 10. Since COVID, since that day in 2020, it's been zero. Yeah. So they lifted it, they said, which maybe more conspiracies, right? But uh, they lifted it so to to try to stimulate spending, you know, get make borrowing cheap because now it's like if banks could lend out more, they could lend out at better rates. All sounds good, right? During a, a time where it was like, the economy was shut down. Right. But now we're talking about, you know, three years later, it's still at zero. So it's like, dude, the bank is lending out all of our money. Yeah. So think about that. Everyone has money, right? You said you need money to do infinite banking. Everyone has money. That might be a thousand dollars a month. It might be a million dollars a month. Everyone has different levels of income, but everyone for the most part flows their money through Wells Fargo, Chase, Bank of America, And then all they do is they just lend it out. They pay you a percentage to keep your money there. 0.001% or whatever. Stupid. It's a little higher now just because rates are higher. Yeah, you could even find my dad was saying Capital One has a savings account now that's paying him 3%. High yield savings account, right? So let's just use 1% to make math easy. So if you put your money in the bank, they pay you 1% to hold your money there, but it's not held there. What do they do? They turn it into loans. So they loan you money on let's say a personal loan at 10%. So they're making 10 with your money. They're just paying you 1%. So what are they doing? They're making the spread. Yeah. They're making a thousand or not be a 900% return. They're paying you one. They turn 1% into 10 with your money. So infinite banking is just doing that, taking that function back. So you put your money in a place that's guaranteed to grow. You borrow against it. If you have, to borrow it at let's say 4% and it's earning you, let's say six. What are you making? So borrowed at four and making six. The spread is two. two. So right? 2%. You're making a 2% spread just by borrowing the money. 
Then you take it and you lend it to you on a real estate deal. Let's say you pay me 12%. So I'm making 12 plus two, but I had to borrow it at four, right? So I'm making 14, but it cost me four to do it. I'm doing the same thing the bank does, right? Yeah. So I'm turning four into 14. That's a 350% return cash on cash because my money is not being used. I'm just borrowing against my money. Yeah. That's, that's all infinite banking is, is making a spread just like banks do. You're just utilizing a vehicle that never stops growing. So the amount you can borrow just keeps going up, guaranteed. It's tax-free. So all that growth isn't taxed. So when it's when it's guaranteed too, um, so it's collateral. The collateral is your policy, right? The collateral is your cash, what you okay. put in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cash that you put in, right? So then even if you don't pay back the insurance policy, right? Essentially, like it's not like they're foreclosing on you or something. It's right. just like your money's just kind of gone, right? Great that you brought that up because um, with these policies, the life insurance company promises two things. They guarantee you your money's going to grow at three and a quarter for the rest of your life. And how do they guarantee that? Because they're conservative. They know they can go make four, five, 6% just by lending money to banks, institutions, putting it into long-term treasury bonds. They're playing the long game. Like if you get a policy right now, you're 30, right? Yeah. You're probably going to live another 50 years. With technology, maybe 60, 70 years. They know you're probably not going to die anytime soon. So they're playing the long game. They're not trying to make a bunch of money real quick. Um, and when you play the long game, you can easily make 6%. Is it right? attached to like the stock market? Nope. They just give you a guarantee because they know they can go make more than three and a quarter. So, so even if, even if a year, let's just say, I don't know, you know, stock market crashes, like all, all assets are, are way down and like, they're not able to lend out and, and make that. Are they still, they're still paying that guarantee? Like every, is there any type of a risk from that standpoint? Never. It's a contractual guarantee, three and a quarter. And then you get dividends based on how profitable the company was the year prior. Companies we use have been profitable. So they've paid a dividend every single year for over a hundred years. So we're talking Great Depression, World War One, World War Two, meltdown of 08. These companies are still profitable. So it's like to say they're not going to be profitable like insurance companies know what the hell they're doing. They just assess risk. So yeah. they're not going to, they're not going to invest in something that's risky. They're not going to insure somebody that's probably going to die soon. Right? So they guarantee two things. Three and a quarter percent is what your money's going to grow at. And they guarantee they're going to pay a death benefit when you pass away. So they know that if you don't pay back your policy loan, they're going to be all right because all they're doing is they're using your money as collateral and letting you borrow your death benefit now. If you don't pay it back, they'll just deduct it when you die. So it's like yeah. it's the best loan ever because you never have to pay it, but you should because if you pay it, your death benefit's made whole. So if you pass away, your family's taken care of. And when you pay the insurance company, the interest they charge you to borrow the money it's one of the ways they're profitable. Again, more profitable they are, the bigger your dividend. Yeah. So you paying your loan back actually it comes back to you in the form of a dividend. That makes sense. Now, you do like if I go and my Wells Fargo savings account, this is essentially free. I don't know. Maybe it costs me like ten bucks to set it up or something. Yeah. Now, if I want to go get a life insurance policy, like I have to pay for life insurance, right? Mm -hmm. So. I know it's making like 3%, but what, what are like the fees involved um, to just have life insurance, even if it's not a, a policy like you're setting up where you could like have the cash early. I mean, life insurance in general does have costs involved, right? Yeah. So the cost of the insurance is basically the, the base premium. That's what pays for the death benefit. So most agents, what they know is a regular policy, which is just base premium. That's also what pays all the commission. So like a lot of people think life insurance is a scam and like the worst place to put money because agents make a ton of commission, which is true because they're just selling a death benefit. So what we do is we do a low death benefit. So there's low cost 
low base premium. And then we just have you over fund it, which gives you all the cash value, but it also has all the other benefits. It's protected against lawsuits and judgments. It's guaranteed to grow, um, tax free. Like, so all you're doing is just overfunding the cost, overfunding the death benefit. Can things like, like, can like a lawsuit or like, could like the IRS like freeze your, like they could like my Wells Fargo account could get like frozen for something like that. Right. Like what about life insurance? How does that work? <clears throat> kind of sort of like life insurance is a private contract between you and the insurance company. So you never have to, um, you never have to report it to the IRS. So they don't really know that you have it. However, if you're getting like audited because, you know, you were not paying your taxes for 10 years or whatever it might be, right? They could probably look into like bank account transfers and see, oh, he's putting 30 grand a year into Mass Mutual or Lafayette Life or One America. Then they can do some digging and probably get those. Yeah, it's like, okay, he's like overfunding that, kind of using that as like money. They could get that then, but that's the only thing. The IRS is the only one that can do that. You can't have a judgment or a lien. Nobody can put it on the life insurance policy in most states. I think it's like 48 states. Arizona is one of them where let's say I've got $10 million in cash value in a policy and someone falls and breaks their leg on one of my properties. They try to sue me. Yeah. They can't get that money. Hmm. There's nothing that can be done. It's impenetrable. They cannot get it. Which right. is also why, dude, I, I highly, highly advise people to look into estate planning, like getting a trust in place and things like that. Cause I don't own anything. Like if you try to sue me, like one, you can't get to my policies cause they're protected against lawsuits and judgments and all my properties, everything else, all my assets, they're owned by trusts. The trust owns them. I don't, I just control it. So yeah, it's the one thing I... I actually don't like about real estate is actually the ownership of it. Yeah. Cause now it's like, you could come take my real estate. Not if it's owned by a trust, right? If it's owned by a trust and they don't really know who owns the trust. Right. But it's like, yeah. if you just own properties in your name, I mean, people could come knocking on your door. Like they could just seize the property. Like it's very easy connection and kind of this, this world we're kind of heading into where like, I just want to be left alone, dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. And real estate is, for the most part, it's not like that. You know, it's hard to be kind of left alone. You you don't right. pay this or you don't pay that. Like judgments against your properties and things like that. So I know you even did this whole like hack with, uh, you, you were telling me about, you, you created a foundation. Mm. Talk, talk to me about what you did with that. Mm. Glad we talked about that. So I pay zero taxes. I literally pay zero taxes. So you pay zero taxes because you created a foundation that you, you fund. How, how does that work? So it's a properly structured trust and foundation structure. So think about most people, they make their money and they file their taxes on a 1040, right? It's a document. Everyone files them on unless you're business owner, 1120 S and all that. But most people 1040, this is filing on a 1041 which is basically just a properly f structured foundation where you can make money and pay zero taxes. If I've got kind of a, an unfair advantage, my wife, she's W2. She can donate 30% of her income to our foundation. So she only pays taxes on 70%. Her 70% is more than enough to live our lifestyle. So I don't need to pay taxes on any of my money, but if she wasn't working, I'd have to hold back my lifestyle. Like if I spend 10 grand a month, let's say I have to hold back and get taxed on $120,000 a year, everything else, the excess, I don't have to pay taxes on all of my income. Cause her income is enough to cover our lifestyle. All my income is excess. So I yeah. put it into my structure, my foundation and trust structure, and I pay zero taxes. And it's all legal just because of how it flows through that structure. Yeah, it's crazy, man. It's like, I feel like we're talking about like rich people shit now. <laughs> you know, it's like, like it, it, it almost doesn't make sense to me though, how it's like the rich people hack 
tax mm -hmm. are what makes people like end up not paying any taxes. Not saying I I don't I don't blame you. I don't blame like if I get to the point where it makes sense to do like you said it costs like didn't you say it costs like eighty thousand dollars to to N set that ninety five grand ninety five grand right? So but I was gonna have to pay four hundred. So I didn't spend right. 95. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saved 305. So, but yeah, that's that's kind of rich people shit we're, we're getting on, right? It's yeah. like, um, you know, considering 98% of people, they're probably not making that. It doesn't make sense. But it's just, it's interesting to me just the way our country is set up where it's like you get to a certain point, it's like now you have all the loopholes and you could do all this. But if you're like just that like middle of the road W2 worker, you're getting fucked on taxes. Yeah. Well, I mean- Again, I want to preface that like I don't pay zero taxes. I tech I technically do, like my businesses, but my wife is my wife. She still pays 70% of her income she has to pay taxes on. Yeah. Not much she can do is like a W two higher but, earner. Yeah, like you can do a 401k, it's the stupidest thing ever. You could we've got write-offs and things that she could potentially do, but like those are owned by the trust, so it's hard, but Bottom line is like, we still pay taxes. We just pay a hell of a lot less. My businesses pay zero. Like, let's say she makes a million dollars. She only pays taxes on 700 grand instead of a million. So there's these hacks where you can pay so much less. And if you have a business like I do, and then a significant other that's a W-2 employee, your businesses can literally pay zero tax. Right. Zero, all legally. And think about that. Like this year, let's say I bring in $2 million. My tax bill on $2 million would be about 800,000, right? If I don't have to pay 800 grand to the IRS, that's $800,000 I can take to go invest and make more. So next year, I'm probably going to have more than 2 million come in, right? Yeah. So let's say I have 4 million that comes in. What's the tax bill on that? 1.6? If I don't have to pay 1.6, I can go invest it and make more. That's when it's just like a compounding effect. That's why they say the rich get richer. Yeah. It's so true. And everyone listening to this, I don't want you to think I'm some pretentious asshole that's just like this rich dude. Like I was dead broke six years ago, like $300 to my name, bankrupt, thoughts of suicide. Like we met three and a half years ago. I had just left my job, had about 60 grand saved up. Yeah. I mean, you've built up all this in a pretty short amount of time. Yeah. You know, and it's from knowing little, little hacks and just a lot of people like they know a lot of stuff, but they don't take action on it. Like Templeton, I talked to him a couple of days ago and he's like, dude, I'm so proud of you. Like, you don't know how many people I've like had to ride alongs and like teach them what I know. And they just don't do anything like you and Jim Montero. Yeah. Love Jim. Such a, such a genuine dude. Yeah. Same. Um, like he said, you and Jim are the two that like took what I taught and just ran with it. So learn things like all the stuff I'm talking about that you talk about that you people hear on your podcast, like learn it, but then just do it. There's no power in just knowing it. Yeah. If you're going to like listen to all this stuff, you better kind of do something with it. Or, yeah. you know, you're going to listen to this episode and then six months from now, you're not going to remember it. If you're not implementing any of the stuff, like Dude, when you read, read that infinite banking book, you like took action right away. And then, you know, that snowballed into kind of other things. But do you think like, like when it comes to like, we're talking a lot about now kind of diving into if you're making good money, how to kind of preserve it, how to grow it, how to make sure, you know, you're not giving it all away in taxes and stuff like that. But like for most people, you know, the 98%, let's say making like under a hundred thousand dollars a year. Do you think it, it still makes sense for people to set up like smaller policies mm -hmm. at, at that level? Yep. Like, is there a certain type of, cause I, I guess in my point of view, I think, and, may, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I look at it like the infinite banking stuff makes a ton of sense if you're like super wealthy and you got a bunch of cash coming in every year, right? Throw it in the policies. You don't really need the cash. You know, you're trying to, at that point, just not necessarily even make more money, but just grow your money. Yeah. And then I also see it like for people making, let's say a really good W2 job, 
like your wife, right? Crushing the W2 game, maybe a couple hundred grand a year, ton of like definitely a lot of excess cash and able to every month, you know, put a, a pretty significant amount. But like the average person that, I don't know, maybe like, you know, they're doing all right. They're maybe making like 60, 80 grand a year. Maybe like some months are good. Some are better than others, but they don't have this like just consistent, like, oh yeah, but money's always coming in. There's always excess money. Like, do you think people like that should be getting these policies? hundred percent. Um, prime example. Yesterday I talked to, um, lady with her husband, it was on speakerphone, uh, Teresa and PJ, and they had 18 grand. They got like an inheritance. They'd never had this much money in their lives. They got all this debt, but they, they heard me on one of my stories and they were going to take this 18 grand and pay debts off. And then they heard me talk about doing it a different way, infinite banking. They went down a rabbit hole, got on a phone call with me and we came up with a plan instead of taking that 18 and paying the debt off, which is good because then they're not paying interest to other people anymore. Instead, put it in the policy. It's going to compound and grow for the rest of their lives. They're young, 28 and 29. So that 18 grand will grow for the rest of their lives into a lot of money. Then they borrow against it, pay off their car. It was 13,000 bucks, 660 a month. So think about this. 660 a month is leaving them and their family. They got two kids forever. They'll never get that 660 back. They'll have the car, but the 660 is gone and what it could have earned them, right? So they're given the 660 away every single month without fail because they don't want their credit to get bad. That's what Americans do every day. You simply change the 18 grand goes into a policy. It's guaranteed to grow, borrow against it, pay the car off. They were already paying 660 a month to the car. Just pay 660 back to their policy. It's not leaving. They're keeping that 660 a month with them. But not only that, there was interest on that car loan. So now they're getting the interest. So I can do things at a big scale because I've made a lot of money. But how do you get to that big scale? You got to start somewhere. And that's somewhere that anyone can start. Pay off a debt that you're paying every month. And just take it, put it back in your policy. So as that policy builds back up, take it, pay off another card, whatever that was, pay it back to the policy. You're just getting a never ending pile of money growing. It'll never get smaller. Are, are the fees for the policy less if you're putting in less? Because I could see like, yep. like you saving 3% or earning 3% on a big number that's having a big impact, you know, 3% on a hundred bucks. It's like, that might not be worth it. If it's a couple hundred dollars of, of fees up front yeah, or whatever. It, it's all relative to the size of the policy. So the, the fees again, are the cost of the death benefit. So that's just lowered. So like, let's say you're putting in 10,000 a year round number. Um, that'd be eight thirty three a month. So 10,000 a year, the cost or the fees, would be about 3000 a year. That's it. Everything else is you overfunding it to get all the cash value. Yeah. So, so if you're doing, right away. yeah, if you're doing 5,000 a year, your cost is about 1500. So it, if you're doing a million a year, your cost is 300,000 a year. You see what I'm saying? So, cause it's buying a bigger death benefit. You can't put a million dollars into a policy on a $1.2 million death benefit. It won't work. It'll become taxable. Yeah. So that, that couple, that young couple, 18 grand, right? They put it in there. Cool. I obviously that's like overfunding it right yep. off the bat. Yeah. So their, they overfunded it. Their cost was probably, I think it was four or five grand. Yeah. So like they put an 18, but they have access to about 13, 14 because mm -hmm. they have access to all the overfunding. So they take the overfunding. That's when they pay the car off. Whatever they were paying on the car, six sixty a month, they just pay it back to the policy, builds the policy back up, the cash value, and they can just use it again. Are they having to put more new money into it as time goes on? Every year, right? Okay. How much money do, do would like they have to put in a year? Um, at least the cost, so at least the death benefit. Okay, and you said like for that it was like four thirty. It's like thirty percent of whatever your max is. Okay, so, so a couple grand a year. Yeah, you basically just set up a max. Like I think I can do twenty grand a year. I think I can do ten. I can. I can do a hundred. Whatever that is, your 
your minimum, your cost, your death benefit is going to be about 30%. Yeah. Of that number. And then let's say like, you know, that the average American, you know, they, they're not great with their money. They, they end up kind of, the more that's coming in every month, they, there might not be as much excess. Let's say that couple in a year from now, they don't have like any extra funds to put into that policy. Right. What, what ends up kind of happening with that policy? <clears throat> Does it continue to grow? Yep. Do they yeah, have so you- to, like, what if they can't pay any fees as the years go on? Like how, how does that all break down? So you have to be like for infinite banking really to work, you have to be disciplined. Like if they paid their car off, but then didn't pay six sixty a month back to their policy, they're not being disciplined. Right. right? Because, yeah. It's like, and some people might kind of, uh, unfortunately, like this is something you have to understand going into it. Yeah. Right. Like if they pay the car off, they were paying six sixty a month to that car loan pay the same thing back to your policy. You're just getting the money you used to give up. That's all you're doing. So like what's 660 a month for 12 months? It's like uh, what, 7, 7,200 or something like that. Something like that, right? Yeah. So let's say that's all they do for a year. They pay that back in the policy and then their premium comes up the next year and they just don't have anything to pay it. They just put seven grand in their policy. They can pay it with their seven grand in the policy. So yeah. that's where you have to be disciplined to always pay yourself back. Cause then if you come on hard times, you don't have extra money to put more premium in. Yeah. You can just use the cash value in your policy to pay the premium. And eventually it's usually year three, year four. You don't even have to do that because the growth outweighs the cost. So you can literally just take the growth, pay the cost of the the policy. Done. Rest so of your the, life. Yeah, like the interest you're making from the policy is paying for the cost of the policy. Exactly. So it's just growing a lot slower then because you're you're taking the growth to pay the cost instead of taking the growth to go make more money. You see what I'm saying? So there's so many ways to keep it going. You just have to be disciplined. Yeah. It, is it tougher for like someone like that to? Um, I guess like what I worry about. What I like having money in like a Wells Fargo account is like. I, I got to send EMD for, you know, a, a wire transfer. Like it's easy. I log onto my account, yep. bang, bang, uh, pay off credit card bills, just pay for a vacation, snowboard trip, Zelle, like, like it's all easy, right? So all yeah. the money's kind of right there. Yep. I, I fear like if I throw all of it or most of it into a, a policy now, it's going to make like that whole aspect of my life more difficult and is yeah. like the inconvenience <clears throat> Does it outweigh, you know, making a couple extra percentage? Maybe, maybe not. But h- how do people kind of handle that? So great question. I, I don't, I flow all my money through policies, but then I'm always taking it back out for things. Yeah. So you go on online and just say, I want a policy loan for 10 grand. Push a few buttons, which account you want it to go to. Boom. A couple of days later, it's in your account. So what I do is I always keep, I've got like 13 bank accounts, just something stupid. Um, I do that for a reason, but in each bank account, I don't keep more than about five grand. So I have at any given time, 60, 70 grand in bank accounts that I can use if I need to. Right. Why do you have 13 bank accounts with like five K mm-hmm. in them all? Why not? Like just like one at, at 60 K. So think of this, you were talking about it earlier with like the banking system. How it's like they're lending out all of the money. There's nothing on reserves. I truly believe if we all went to the bank today, they wouldn't like, 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 like people talk, you, you heard what happened with FTX. Yeah. Right. If it's the same thing with our, our big banks. Yeah. Like, like but they don't have the money to give you money. So here's, here's why I do that is let's say, and this happened in COVID, they put a limit on how much you can take out. So if you've got a hundred grand in a bank account, and they say you can only take out five thousand bucks. You're screwed. You've only you've they're locking up ninety five grand of your money because they don't have it. Oh, so I see. So what I do is I spread it out between multiple accounts. So let's say I've got ten accounts, five grand each, and they put a limit of five grand. I can take out fifty grand because I've got it spread over different banks. Yeah, it was. It was uh, about a year and a half ago. I was redoing, wanted to redo the side of my driveway and I had to pay my landscapers, didn't want to cash, go to, go to Wells Fargo, cost five grand. 
right? Show up. I'm like, hey, I need five grand cash. They look at me like I have three heads on. And they're like, what do you need it for? What are you, oh, what are you doing? Like, they're question. like grilling me. And I was just like, dude, give me my fucking money. Like, yeah. this is also, it's not a, that in the grand scheme of thing, like I'm at Wells Fargo, dude, it's 5,000 bucks. Yep. Like, like it's, it's a fucking part of a driveway. It's not even like a big deal. So then I, I went to them. I go, you know what, actually deposit or, or withdraw $50,000. I was like, I want 50. And they're like, oh, for that, you're going to need uh, an appointment in three weeks from now and like all this shit. So that's when I really realized I was like, damn dude, like they're, they're giving me a hard time because they don't have the fucking cash. Yeah. If everyone did this and everyone online right here all wanted to pull out 20 grand, good luck. The banks yeah. don't have your money. That's why, that's why I keep it in policies for the most part. Cause insurance companies have all the money. Like you look at the biggest, best buildings in most cities top. It's an insurance company that owns it. They own the buildings and they just lease the buildings out to different people. That's part of the way they're profitable is lease payments for buildings they own. They lease it to companies, right? Part of their portfolio. They own real estate. Um, they have all the money. So I'm going to put my money there where it's guaranteed to grow, protected against lawsuits and judgments, and knowing I can get it whenever I want. Contractually, if I have cash value and I want it, I get it. There's no questions asked, no financial statements, no credit checks, no, what's this used for? What's your blood type? What the, 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 like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. send me this code that verifies your, you like, no, it's, it's my money. Right. Yeah. So I put all my money there instead of in a banking system. That's flawed where I don't know if it's going to be there. If I'm gonna be able to use it. Cause it's not there. It's lent out. Yeah, dude. So, <laughs> Banks are, uh, I don't know, man. I, we, we were talking about it today, just, just more into it. Like, there's risk, obviously, with everything. Who the fuck knows, right? Insurance policy one day, maybe they run out of it, It's like, if they're running out of money, that means, like, the banks already ran out of money. That probably means, like, the U.S. dollar is crashed and dissolved. It's like, th there's always going to be some type of risk. But I do think, I, I don't know what you think. It just in the financial world in general, because I know you pay a, a lot of attention to it, but I foresee in 2023 bank runs happening the way we saw with like FTX and, and crypto markets. Yeah. And I don't know how that's going to end. I, I personally think it might end in them realizing like they obviously don't have our cash. Yeah. Right. We know they don't have our cash, but I think that I think what might end up happening is they go, whoops. Yeah. We don't have your cash. We're just going di di to digitalize it all. And then we're all fucked at that point. Yeah. I don't like thinking about like the doomsday thing, like what's going to happen with banks. Cause like, who knows, man? I mean, the banks are corrupt. Like if the banks and the federal government, if you and I did what they do, we'd be in prison. Like they literally print money. Yeah. That's legitimately what, the federal government does right they go into debt with a t-bill which is just creating more money and that debt they pay it back with weaker dollars because they've created more money which devalues every dollar if we did that we'd be in prison right right uh, also on top of that like the the fdic it's a joke that's supposed to be insured all of our money up to two hundred fifty thousand or whatever right so it's like oh i'm secure dude if we all went to the bank and the bank doesn't have our money, you think that insurance, you think the FDIC has all of our money? No, they don't have anything, bro. And the crazy thing is the federal reserve, it's not federal and it, there's no reserve. Yeah. Like, there's nothing there. So, and then I think it's so funny because they come up with different things to make it sound better than it really is like quantitative easing. <laughs> right. Like that sounds better than printing money. But that's what it is. Quantitative easing is just printing more money. <laughs> yeah. And every more dollar they print, like mine is worth worth less now. Yeah. Sitting in the bank. So it's it's really tough times, man, to like know what to do. Not even like trying to find a like like an hack to make a couple extra percentage, but literally just a safe place to hold my money. Like I'm I'm starting to finally understand why like our grandparents' generation would hide actual cash 
in mattresses and things like that. When I was a kid, like it made no sense. I was like, oh, it's a bank. Like, you know, the bank's got all the money. Yeah. Why wouldn't you just leave it in there? Like, yeah. it, you know, it doesn't, it didn't make any sense to me, but seeing what's happening in like <laughs> the world today, like, I just don't know. Should you go to Wells Fargo and like slowly take out all your cash or should you leave it in there and, and kind of hope that they have it when, Dude, when that, you need it? That's why I put all my money in policies. Like it's guaranteed to grow. It'll never, ever grow less than three and a quarter. And even three and a quarter, that hasn't happened for over a hundred years because it's the guarantee plus the dividend. As I said, the dividend has been paid every single year for over a hundred years. So yeah. like the guarantee is basically guaranteed not to be that. It's going to be higher. And then it's protected against lawsuits and judgments. These insurance companies aren't going out of business. They're not being bailed out by the, the government. They're the most profitable, stable companies in the nation. One of them has been in business for 180 years. Yeah. It's like, like, you know, no one knows the future for, you know, at some point that you would imagine that that will end like everything else in the world. But if you're trying to just figure out like a pretty damn safe place to be. Is it going to end in our lifetimes? Probably not. Yeah. I, I wouldn't bet that it is. Probably not. So like, that's where I'm putting all my money. Because then it also um, protects my human life value. Like, let's just say I make a million dollars and I'm 38. Let's say I can work for another 30 years making just a million. I don't make any more than a million each year, right? So for another 30 years, that's $30 million. If I die tomorrow, my family doesn't get that 30 million that I could have made. Right? right. Yeah. So if I put my money into policies and I pass away tomorrow, my family gets what I potentially could have made in tax free money. So it's just whatever your cash value is and you die, your family gets a multiple of it. So if you've got hundred grand that you've put in your death benefit could be 8 million bucks. You, you put in a hundred grand, you die the next day, your family gets $8 million. Yeah. So, which I mean, I mean, that's the reason why, majority of people just get life insurance in, in yeah. general. So yeah. this is kind of like you get uh, replace it as kind of your bank. Yeah. Cause all you're doing it again, the is bank's not giving you any death benefits or anything like that. If anything, they're going to give you a hard time trying to get that money out of a dead person's name. Yeah. Dude, all you're doing is you're, you're buying life insurance. So you have a death benefit in case you pass away, your family's taken care of. But then if it's structured the way we structure ours, you're using the death benefit now. Your money's just the collateral to borrow the death benefit. So you're just using your death benefit while you're alive. It's called life insurance. It's not called death insurance, right? Yeah. If it's used correctly, it should be used while you're alive. Yeah, makes sense. Right? So then that's all I do is I just teach people how to do that. And the coolest part, dude, is like I've never paid for marketing. So it's just me putting videos out that catch people's attention. They go into a funnel, they watch a longer video that teaches them more about it. And then they get on a call with either me or someone on my team. And it's never a sale. Like I'm not sitting there being like, you know, always be closing mirror the customer. Like I learned all that crap in sales for so many years. I don't do any of that. I just explain how I use it and how it works. And every single call, I'd say 99% of the time it ends with, Dope. How do I do it? Like, what do I do next? Yeah. And then it's just me setting the policy up. Is there, is there a situation where, when you're going through that, where it just doesn't make sense for someone to do a life insurance policy this way? Um, no. Like if they're not healthy enough that you gotta get creative because you can't get a life insurance policy if you're not healthy enough. So gotta be, like, gotta be healthy enough. Yeah. Right. But besides that, you think pretty much no matter someone's situation, no matter what they have going on, it's, it's, it's a better option to do this. I is, believe kind of like a better option. Like, does it come between like, should I do this life insurance policy or should I put it in a, a savings account earning 3%? Dude, I believe everyone should do it because a couple things, everyone's going to die. You're going to die at some point. So if you have life insurance, your family's taken care of you're going to borrow money or you're going to spend your own. Everyone's going to, even if you're a bum on the streets and you panhandle, you get the money, you're going to spend it. Right. 
or you're going to get a loan if you have credit and you're going to spend that money. So you're going to die. Everyone's going to die. It's guaranteed. If you have life insurance, your family's taken care of. You're going to spend money. So wouldn't you want to spend somebody else's and have your money grow and compound for the rest of your life? You're just borrowing against it. So everyone should do it. It's just everyone doesn't, they don't understand it. They don't understand how it works. So that's like my goal and my mission is just to teach people how this works, to try to keep it simple so they can understand it. And then if they understand it, like everyone that understands understands it, they're like, yeah, why wouldn't I do this? Why didn't I do it 10 years ago? Yeah. It's because you didn't know about it. And how many, how many policies do you currently have? Personally? Yeah. I have nine. And then I've got my 10th and 11th one um, in process right now. And it makes sense to have multiple policies compared yes. to just like overloading this like one huge death benefit one? Uh, yes, because you can only overfund the policy so much before it becomes taxable. I see. So let's say I start my first one and I can put in 10 grand. I can't put in more than 10 grand because that's the limit. That's what I set the limit as. So let's say I put in 10 grand, I've got access to seven. I take that seven and I double it. So I pay back the seven I borrowed. So now I've got the full seven here. The 10 is still compounding, but I made an extra seven. What do I do with the extra seven? I can't put it in this policy. Let me start another one. Get that seven compounding. Then I can borrow against that one and this one. Go make even more money. As I make more money, pay those back. I can't put the extra money I made back in those. I got to start another one. So that's why I've got so many of them is I've just used them the right way to go make more money. As I have more money to put in, I can't put it in those ones or they'll become taxable. So I just start more. Yeah. I love it, dude. It's, uh, I, I think, I don't know, man, I, I keep running through like, well, maybe, maybe it's better to do this or better to do that. But it, I mean, you're talking to a guy who like doesn't trust his freaking money in, in a Wells Fargo account. You know, right. so it's like, it, it is really hard to just figure out like an easy vehicle. I think, I think the one holdup for me has just been like, just like the, the headaches of like, if I have to like send wires or like move money around. And That's why you always just keep money in your bank accounts, but you spread it out. That's yeah. why I've got it like that. So that if I need to send something real quick, I never really do that. But if I have to, it's there. What I usually do is I just use credit cards. Like, cause I yeah. want points, flyer miles. Right. Yeah. But, but then I just use my policies to pay the credit cards off. So I don't pay any interest to them. I get all the points and flyer miles. And then I just use, I act like I'm the credit card company. I just pay my policy back what I would have paid the credit card company. How does that like affect like your like debt to income ratio? Does it, does it have any impact on the, the policy loans? Yeah. Yeah. It, like does it's it It's not count? reported. So. Okay. So. Like if, or if I was going to a lender and they were doing like a bank statement only type loan, would they, would they potentially look at like a policy like that the same way as if that money was in a bank account? Yep. Yeah. We just did, um, a loan on one of our Airbnbs and they wanted to see like six months of reserves. So yeah, that's kind of what, what I'm getting at. Yeah. They wanted to see that six months of reserves we just didn't have it in a bank account because we just don't keep that much in bank accounts, but we had it in a policy. So we just show them a statement that shows the cash value in the policy. At the time it was like 600 grand. That's the reserves, right? So it works for that. And um, yeah, you just never have to report it. That's the cool thing. Yeah. Fucking infinite banking, dude. Dude, it's, it's changed my life, man. It's, and I can only, it's a long game because compound interest takes time. Like the longer you give it, the bigger it gets. Prime example is my first big policy was 150 grand. I funded it on March of 2020. So I'm about to fund March 28th of this month or 28th of this month. I'll fund 150 grand. The first year I put in 150, I had access to like 121 because there's costs. There's fees to pay for the death benefit. I don't have access to everything. The next year I put in 150, I had access to like 142. This year I put in 150 because of the growth, because of the dividend, I have access to 170. Oh, so you have access to, to more money than you're, you're even putting in. Yeah. 
And the longer that happens, the bigger the difference. So like in 20 years, I'll be 58. In that policy, I put in a dollar, I can take out like seven. So I, wouldn't I just want to keep putting more in there if I can just borrow out more than what I put in? Yeah. It just takes time. Compound interest takes time. So I've done amazing with infinite banking in the first three years. I can only imagine when I'm in year like 20, year 30 of my policies, dude, I'm going to put in like a hundred grand, borrow out a million, <laughs> go buy a, a house, have it cash flow, pay myself back and just rinse and repeat. Like, right. Dude, it's stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, like for most people, it's, it's hard to get to that point where it's, it's really starting to compound and like, you know, you, you see the effects. I mean, like a lot of things, like even just like starting a podcast, right? First couple episodes, first year, maybe first two years, it doesn't do that much. And then like, as time goes on, you know, things start compounding and snowballing. And, you know, I think everyone is always looking, I, I feel like sometimes people might watch your content with like the wrong intentions by thinking it's like a, a quick hack to mm -hmm. like get rich quick or, you know, do this, but it's, it's really a long-term type of in investment wealth strategy. It's not, it is. it's not a way to make a quick buck. Like, no, like wholes wholesaling is a way to make a quick buck, but infinite banking is not. Dude, if you think about it, the first two years in that policy I just told you about, I technically lost money. I didn't really lose it because it's going to my death benefit. I'm going to die someday. So that death benefit's going to get paid to my family. So I didn't lose it. I, I paid for something that's going to be paid to my family eventually. Yeah. But technically, I don't have access to it, so I kind of lost that money. Right. So my, my like, if someone is very kind of more just short term thinking, right? Like they're they're if you're short term thinking, infinite banking is not for you. You have to think long term. Yeah. Because most people that don't do a policy with me, they look at the illustration that shows you year one. I put in this. Here's what I have access to. Year two, put in this. Here's what I have access to. They look at that and they're like, oh, like. If I put in 10 grand, I only got access to seven. That's stupid. If I put 10 grand in my bank, I got access to all 10. But they're not seeing long term. In four or five years, you put in 10, you have access to 15. It's 10 years, you put in 10 grand, you have access to 25. I think the average person doesn't even realize, like, when they go get a mortgage, that, like, look how much principal you paid down your first couple of years. Almost nothing. It's going to be super low. Yeah. You know, and I think it's kind of like a similar idea, but people don't look at, you know, it's like, Oh, buy a house, get a mortgage. You oh know, dude. But the banks are great at this. Banks know that people don't own homes for 30 years. Nobody oh, yeah. owns homes for 30 years nowadays, maybe back in the day, but like they know that on average, and I used to be in mortgages. So I know this on average, people refinance every three years. So they're not keeping a 30 year mortgage if they don't refinance because they want cash out or they want to, do a 15 or they want to whatever. If they're not doing that, they sell the house and they move and they get another 30 year mortgage. So you just and made it re the resets, the amortization. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's not about the interest rate that's paid. It's about the volume of how much interest is paid. So like, if you think about a 2% interest rate that was a couple years ago, People were like, oh my God, I have to have that rate. But if they were in a loan that they ha they've had for like seven years, they'd be better off staying in that loan because now they're chipping away at principal. Yeah, even that two year, I mean, that 2% rate, right? Like that's still, uh, those first couple years, you're still not really paying down any principal. Yeah. So you're still just paying a shit ton of interest regardless yeah. of what your, your payment is. Yeah. It's ridiculous. The first seven to eight years, I believe it is, 80 something, 83, 84%, something like that goes towards interest. Right. Yeah. So for the first like eight years, you're paying of your payment. If you're paying a thousand bucks a month, you've only got about 170 bucks. Yeah. And that's kind of where it comes to like, sometimes where like the conversation of like renting versus owning. I was kind of having this conversation with my dad. He's like, I don't want to throw away like rent money. But I'm almost like dad, like if you like buy a place and then you sell it in like five years. I mean, with, if you don't bank on appreciation, you're not really saving yourself anything because you're not paying down any of that principal really, yeah. you know, in that short amount of time. So it's like, sure, appreciation could happen, but also the opposite could happen. And now you're stuck with the house and, 
You know, it's like it's it's a and more it's, complex debate and conversation, I think, than a lot of people kind of give credit to just not understanding the way loans work. Yeah. If it was me, dude, I've I've, I've heard lots of people have like different takes on this, like rent or own. I think it always makes sense to own. That's just me personally. Like if you own it, you're building equity over time. You can leverage that equity. You hope. What if you buy right now though? And then over time, you're still going to, it's still going to appreciate. Like think about this first property in 2008, it was like November. I was 22, 23 years old as a condo. I bought it for 88,000 bucks. Yeah. Bro. Four months later, it was worth 30. Right. Right. Like I was like, that was, that was like the worst time to freaking buy it. Dude, got rid of that house 2012 on a short sale. I looked it up recently. It's worth like almost 300 grand. So right. like if you buy a house now and the market goes down, it's still going to be worth more in 10 years. Right. But I, I mean, the same thing could be said, like, I mean, anything that I bought, like, like if I, I bought eggs 10 years ago, for a dollar a dozen, it's like, well, shit, dude, if I bought eggs today, I'm paying like $5 a dozen. It's like the prices of everything. I hope you would have ate those eggs by now, though. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but like, like, like the point is kind of, you give things enough time, like obviously things are going to go up. I think it's an overrated, in my opinion, aspect of real estate is like appreciation because everything you give things enough time yeah. to appreciate, like everything is more expensive. That's just one aspect to it. So yeah, appreciation's good, but then you've got you've got um, things that you can do with your taxes, right? You can write off your interest. Yeah, you can have depreciation. Like you can't do that when you're renting. Um, if if you actually have rentals, which I know you do, I do, they're great because they have cash flow. Yeah. So you're not even actually paying the payment. Your renters are, so they're building the equity for you. You're getting a hundred percent of the benefits, but you only had to put up a fraction of the money to get it. Sometimes zero, right? But if you buy one traditionally, if you buy, let's say a hundred thousand dollar house, you put 20% down, you had to put $20,000 in that deal. The bank did 80%, but you're getting a hundred percent of the benefits with taxes, the cash flow, and all that, right? So I think there's always benefits to owning. Um, and maybe it's too, I just never want to go back to like those days when I rented cause I was so broke. Yeah. You know? And I mean, if you, if you think though, in hindsight, instead of buying in 08, if you would have been renting, you probably would have been in a better position. Yeah. Cause I wouldn't have had the short sale. Yeah. Yeah. So my credit took a, a definitely a hit for a while. Yeah. You know, I, I think, th I think there's risk. I don't know. It's like I was, I, because my parents want to move out here in September and they're like, we should buy or should we rent? And I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, there, there's pros and cons kind of to both for people in that situation, especially if they don't know exactly how long they're going to hold on to something for. But I'm with you. Like if, you know, if you give real estate 10 plus years. Dude, wife and I were thinking lose. about, like we built our home and we got the perfect time, dude. We, yeah, you did. I remember when you bought that lot, like right early start of COVID. It was, uh late 2020 right right okay. before like costs of lumber went up like crazy and so when we were done with the house i think it was 815 grand and we just got it appraised recently to get an equity line on it 1.5 so it's like yeah like we cr we've crushed it but like part of me is like man maybe we should sell this and use that money and then just rent for a little bit have the market come down, but well, that's kind of what I was saying with my parents. They sold at the they sold their house in New Jersey at the peak, perfect mm. time, right? Um, end of like twenty twenty one. So, and then they went right into renting. They wanted to rent in New Jersey for a year. So I'm almost like, hey, maybe like the fact that you you were able to sell high and you didn't have to buy high at the same time, like maybe rent for a little while, see if and when kind of prices come down. If they do, which I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. I wish I had a crystal ball. Right. No one knows. My dad's like, I, I saw in the news, the, the market's up. Like, dad, I have like the smartest real estate people in here all the time. It's all I look into, all I talk about. And my consensus is no one really fucking knows. No one really knows. Like my gut kind of tells me it's not going to really change much. 
in Phoenix. In Phoenix, yeah. Every market, yeah. Real estate market's not like the stock market. You got to yeah. micro, you know, down it. Even what happens here in Gilbert and Chandler might be different than what's happening in, in North Phoenix and Paradise yeah. Valley. And Yeah, like those areas where there's a lot of money, they're not going to be really affected because people can afford those properties still, right? And then there's supply and demand issues. Like they're building, dude, if you look around when you're driving in Phoenix, everywhere you look, they're building like a new apartment complex. Yeah, it's nuts. They're building a new condo complex. They're building a bunch of homes with a development. It's crazy because so many people want to move here. Less taxes than California and all the BS with the California law. And you can get properties for actually kind of a discount here opposed to California. So yeah. people will sell a house there, have all this money, they'll buy a comparable house here and it's like half the price. They're like, this is amazing. So I, I don't, again, I personally don't think in Phoenix it's going to drop much, um, but who knows? Who really knows? If it drops, the cool thing is in 08, I wasn't ready. Like I wasn't in the position I'm in now. If it drops now, I'm ready to, to make some moves, which, yeah. is, which is exciting. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's I'm kind of in the same boat. Like, I think it's going to be very dependent on what the Fed does with interest rates. But the fact that, like, you saw, like, one of the biggest jumps in interest rates and, like, the market didn't really go, like, it, like, it wasn't this disaster. If anything, it was more just, like, speculation and fear when things started turning that it would get really bad. Yeah. And now, you know, here we are in March 23, and it's kind of like, Prices aren't going up. They're not really going down. It's leveled. If you have like a really nice, attractive property, like you're, you're still getting, like those are still selling pretty fast. I think kind of like the shittier inventory is sitting longer. There's there's less buyers out there. But yeah, I don't I don't see a big crash coming. It, it'd be nice if, if that did happen. Yeah. But that's why I think it's so important to have rentals. Because like, as rates go up, less people can qualify to own a home. It's just call for what it is. If if there's a five hundred thousand dollar house at two percent interest, a lot of people can afford it. If that's at six percent interest, now it's way beyond their reach. Yeah. Right? For the same exact house. Totally. So what do they have to do? They have to they rent. rent. So that's why I think it's so important to own real estate as rental properties because you have infinite demand there's always going to be a demand for renters yeah. um, and rent rates have never fallen in the last like 60 years yeah so you're just going to keep being able to get more rent and more rent and more rent your if you're on fixed debt it you know your payment should stay the same stays the same your balance goes down so you have more equity and you can leverage that equity like a good friend of ours that keeps that's all he does. He cross collateralizes all of his yep. debt or all of his, his houses. So he'll get a big equity line. So he's not having to borrow from anyone else like hard money and private money. He just goes, uses his equity to go buy more houses. Yeah. And if you could deal through the pain of like the first, you know, 15 years of maybe owning those rental properties and not making as much all of a sudden in 15 years, the rent prices you're getting there. And then when you look at the loan, all the principal pay down, you just start chewing away every single month that's when it gets really good right again takes time dude yeah nothing the, worth having in life to, in my opinion i've learned this over 38 years is anything worth having just takes time yeah like if you're trying to get an amazing shape it's going to take time it's going to take effort it's going to take consistency you're going to be in the gym every day you're going to eat the right foods you're yeah, going to plan drink. action stay consistent stay disciplined like, yeah like if you're going to try to be the best husband you can be, it takes time. You have to constantly put in work with your wife or your husband. You have to constantly be doing all the little things consistently over time for you to be a great spouse. Yeah. Like if you're going to be a great business owner, it does not happen overnight. I'm, I'm not a good business owner. I'll just call it for what it is. I've only been doing it for a few years, but I'm pretty damn good at money. Right. Yeah. So like I've built that my next step and my next evolution is becoming a really good business owner, building businesses and having those work for me. It takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. So, um, mm -hmm. anything worthwhile, it takes time. I agree, man. It's, uh, there's no easy ways to success. And it's, I, I think a lot of people that initially 
like consume our type of content. That's maybe why they're starting to consume it, you know, but I, I also like don't want it to fall into the bucket of what some people sell on the internet, which is just like, yeah, get rich quick. It's easy. It's like, no, no, it's hard, but you can, but you look at both our lives, dude. It's like in a few short years, you know, we went from not much to, you know, being in pretty good financial position. So it's not going to happen overnight, but it, it is also something, dude, you, you stick to a course of action kind of like you did in a few short years, man. I mean, that, that uh, ride along with Templeton doesn't seem that long ago in my mind. No, dude, perfect story to kind of like, um, illustrate what you're saying. New year's of 2019, I learned about wholesaling. So I was with my buddy, Corey Talbert. Um, we were both in mortgages and I'm like, man, I want to start owning rental properties. I want to get into real estate. I want to flip homes. Like, cause you see HGTV, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> this was January 1st, 2019. We're all drunk. We're talking about being in real estate. And he's like, dude, why would you do that? Why don't you do this thing called wholesaling? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, man, David knows this guy, Carlos Reyes, that does this wholesaling thing. And I'm like, what is it? He's like, oh, you just sell paper. Like, I don't really know exactly how it works, but you should look into it. I'm like, all right. So from January 1st, 2019, until like September of that year, dude, I just devoured content. I watched podcasts like this. I would, I would read books. I would listen to YouTube videos. Learned all this stuff but didn't do anything. Right? Yeah. Just learned, 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 and learned. I don't think it's bad to be learning for like to, to get into that. So like you commit a hundred percent to it and yeah. you actually believe it. Like, I think it's good to get excited and do all that and get a good base but for, you, for a couple months. You have to take action. You got to though, then transition into action. Dude, I was learning, 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 but just paralyzed by fear. Yeah. Cause dude, all I knew was being an employee. Working right. for someone else. It was comfortable. It was comfortable. Was making, what you knew. I was making six figures. I had it to where I worked reduced hours. So like I only had to work 32 hours a week. That's yeah. it. I worked 32 hours in one second. As soon as that 32 <laughs> hours, boom, clocked out. Yeah. I could work from home. I had it basically set as a W2 employee. I accrued my PTO faster than anyone because of my tenure. So I had it set. I was comfortable. But like, I was unhappy, dude. I was unhappy being an employee because I hate being told what to do. I think that's why I'm a good entrepreneur. Because like, yeah. if you tell me what to do, I'm like, screw you. Like, so September comes around. I hadn't done anything, paralyzed by fear. And I'm scrolling through Instagram and I see Temp. He's like posting about one of his flips. And... I'd always scrolled through Instagram and I knew Temp was a realtor from back in the day. He'd been one since like 2015, so like four years. I'd always, I'd never really read captions. I just thought he was like showing one of his properties as a realtor. I read the caption, it was like one of my flips. And I'm like, Temp flips? I know Temp, let me learn from him. So like I just reached out and I'm like, dude, how much do I have to pay you just to ride along for one day figure this out. Like how you do this. I don't want to be an employee anymore. I want to do what you're doing. I want to flip properties. I want to wholesale. And he's like, you don't got to pay me anything. You're the homie. Just come along with me. When's a good day. And I was like Fridays. So that's when that first ride along happened. Yeah. And dude, I quit my job like two weeks later. I remember that locked yeah. up a contract. That's what she said, thought I was going to make like 200 racks. And I circled the, I, I can show you the picture I actually brought off camera, but I, I took a screenshot and circled the day on the calendar that you were quitting. Yeah. That, that I actually quit October 8th of 2019. So our ride along was, I think September, September 17th. Okay. So a couple weeks later, I quit my job, walked in, I got promoted that day. They were promoting me. They're like, Hey, you hit your numbers. We're promoting you to triple crown mortgage banker. I'm like, sick i'm i'm quitting I'm <laughs> so like but like from then on out i had no clue what i was doing i saw temp do it so i kind of had an idea i learned all this stuff on on social media and like youtube i really didn't know what i was doing i just took a leap i took a leap and just grew my wings on the way down yeah figured you know? it out uh, along the way 
that's it, dude. And I, I, I think now where I'm at and it's kind of surreal, dude. It really is. Like there's times where I'm just like, is this really my life? Like four years ago, yeah. if you would have told me, Hey dude, you're going to be on all these podcasts. You're going to have all these wealthy friends, this dope R8 V10 sitting outside in the parking lot right now. <laughs> dope R8 that you're the bank on. You're going to have two other cars. You're the bank on. You're going to have a sick house. You're going to have all these rentals. You're going to have affiliate income. You're going to have all this money coming in, in just four years. I would have been like, you're crazy. I'm selling mortgages. What are you talking about? Right? Yeah. You got to take a leap sometimes and take, take, take some of those risks. Take a leap and just grow your wings, man. And just know it takes time because nothing that's worthwhile happens overnight. Overnight. Yeah. And be okay to adapt and pivot, dude. Like you, the whole, the whole wholesaling, building out that business wasn't really your thing. Like you were kind of struggling. Like I hated it. You bro. did some deals, but you didn't really like it. And then kind of pivoted and then you saw something that oh like you said earlier you know in our convo like saw an opportunity and you were ready to capitalize on it because you were already like in that mode you quit your corporate job you didn't have something to fall back on you had to figure it out yeah from there 100%. And, and you did dude and yeah man I'm proud of you to see uh see where you're at thanks bro well it's just the beginning man it's exciting to see like where all of our friend group is kind of going and what we're doing yeah and just knowing that you know 10 years from now, we'll look back and be like, dude, remember when we were in that little teeny studio? Right. Little flip lab studio. We'll be <laughs> like, we'll be like sitting in your huge studio. Like it overlooks like the beach and right. just making big moves. And again, it all comes from a place of service. You do this to serve other people, to help other people. And the more you do that, the more it comes back to you. So just, I believe that a hundred percent dude, but great having you on. We're, we're about to kill these cameras. So we got to stop talking. I love it. Dude, we, we dropped <laughs> some gold for the people. So yeah. I would highly, uh, highly just advise people to, to rewind, re-listen to things, share this with other people. It all goes back to service. So like what I did is I made big moves from serving other people by helping other people. Maybe you don't know what your thing is that you can help people with. It could be something as little as just sharing this. Yeah. Share this with someone that you feel it can, can get value from it. That's you helping somebody share with a bunch of people. That's you helping a bunch of people, um, indirectly. So just be of service to other people. The more you do that, the more it comes back to you. Start by sharing this with everyone, you know, appreciate it, man. Great having you on Mr. Burr, go find him on Instagram. If you need policies, if you need a set up some crazy foundations and <laughs> not pay taxes. Also hit up Devin that way. If you like that kind of weird stuff. Yeah. If you like weird banking stuff, Devin's your guy, man. Appreciate you having me, bro.